very much forward to a proper debate and holding on to 20 minutes or so for comments, questions, and observations. Please do use the chat room facility to, to do that. Uh, and please, uh, when we move into the open session, do go ahead and raise your hands and I will try and call upon you. Now, this policy debate is to discuss firms and environmental innovation. And the various issues that we're going to cover are going to be dealt with by our four speakers. I'll introduce them as they come on, but uh, Ellen is going to be talking about green finance and environmental innovation. Uh, Alessandra Tanda is dialing in from Italy and is going to be talking about digital finance and its role. Harry Elliott is going to provide us with uh, green finance, two proper case studies of Pulpex and Diox really coming from the industry side of life. And finally, giving us a city and financial and investment perspective, Van is going to be talking about transforming finance for sustainability. So it is uh, really an immense and rich program. And to get us cracking, Ellen's going to get her slides up at the moment. And I'd just like to say a couple of words about her. Uh, Ellen is a lecturer, so she's part of the home team here. Uh, but her recent publications have been included papers in the Review of Quantitative Finance and Accounting, Business Strategy and the Environment, the Journal of Investing, and the Journal of Fixed Income. So Ellen, the floor is uh, very, very much yours. Thank you, Michael. So hello, everyone. I'm Ellen. And oh, should I? Hello everyone, I'm Ellen. I would like to talk about the green finance and the uh, uh, environmental innovation. So what is the green finance? And whether the degree of a company's environmental innovation will have an impact on its financing cost. So uh, let me start with the definition of a green finance. The green finance is uh, any financial activity that has been created to ensure, uh, to ensure a better environmental outcome. So, for example, the company can raise the capital from the global financial market by issuing the green bonds. Then, since the first green bond issued by the European Central Bank in 2007, the average annual growth rate is around 95%. Then, despite the impact, of a COVID-19, uh, 2020 market issues still stood around uh, uh, 223 billion US dollars. Then, as you can see from the, the map on the right hand side, the countries with the darker blue color issue more green bonds. Then in 2020, the United States, China, France, Germany and the Netherlands were the top five countries in green issuance. Then uh, let's look at the left hand side. For investors' behavior on green finance, according to a recent survey in 2020, around 43% 43 of global fund managers think the climate change is the most critical factor among the environmental, social, and the governance factors. That in the literature, the scholar already finds the social factor or religion factor can shape how investors think, which can also affect investors' financial decision. As you can see in photo one, it's the environmental supporter Greta Thunberg, right? Mm -hmm. So large institutional investors like a Japanese government pension fund are urged by global environmental supporters to report their impact on the environment. Then the story in photo two, can you see photo two? Is that in 2021, the German constitutional court declared the German government's climate protection goal as insufficient, therefore ruling in favor of a young environmental supporter who had a broader case. Then in photo three, so this lady are a group of Dominican sisters. So the story was in 2018, the Dominican sister poor alone with donations, more than 46 million US dollar. Uh, 
uh, to create a fund targeted at the financing solution to address the environmental issues. Okay, so now let me move to the next slide. So we can say the environmental protection values and the shared belief uh, can shape how investors think and influence their financial decisions. In addition to the environmental and the social movements, the policy intervention can also influence investors' risk perception. So for example, uh, from March 2021, the funds can order <coughs> one of the three categories. So funds classified as Article 6 are non-ESG, while the other two types of funds consider the ESG factors. Now, this type of a policy intervention may reduce investors' demand for certain type of companies, such as oil or coal producing companies, and possibly will drive up this company's cost of equity. Then because of investor risk perception, we, we can easily predict the company which are recognized by investor to be involved in greater greenhouse gas emission and environmental misconduct will be penalized by investors. So consequently, these companies will experience an increase in their financing cost. Okay, so now I would like to talk about our research questions. So here we are interested in finding out whether the degree of a company's environmental innovation can also influence investor risk perception. If this is the case, will a company's financing cost be cheaper or more expensive. So we, we adopt the definition propo uh, proposed by Angelo and uh, the other two co-authors in 2012. Uh, they define the environmental innovations. The main objective of environmental uh, innovation is to reduce the company's environmental impact through the company's products manufacturing process and marketing. And in our study, the measurement of a company's environmental innovation degree is to evaluate a company's performance in several dimensions, covering environmental product innovation, green revenues, and R&D, and so on. Then green revenue is defined as a percentage of sales of products that benefit the environment, such as uh, the cleaner air and the water or land. Okay, so I would like to share our part of our result with, with you. So we divide our sample firms. So uh, our sample firms uh, include a roughly 1,400 companies uh, across 43 countries, and the sample period is ranged from 2013 to 2019. As you can see, although the top three most polluting industry are the energy, you can see the energy, material, and the utility sectors according to the greenhouse intensity. So we calculate the greenhouse gas intensity as the uh, total greenhouse gas emission divided by, by sales. And as you can see on the right hand side, the company in the energy sector has a much lower degree of environmental innovation than the company in the material and the utility sectors. Okay, so now I would like to share our finding with you. So can the degree of firms a company's environmental innovation uh, help a company assess triple finance. So our empirical result shows the degree of a company's environmental innovation is not appreciated by the market yet. So investors perceive a company with a higher degree of environmental uh, innovation as a riskier investment and therefore require a greater reward 
So this implies a company's financing cost could be more expensive if a company has a higher degree of environmental innovation. So uh, according to the definition of how the rating agency measures a company's environmental innovation degree, a company with a higher degree of environmental innovation has a greater environmental product innovation, higher green revenue, and greater R&D cost. Uh, we can confirm, as you can see here, the a higher R&D intensity, so it's R&D cost divided by sales, a higher R&D intensity can bring down a company's financing cost. So a possible explanation for our result is investors have not appreciated a company having a higher percentage of green revenues and a, great, a greater environmental product innovation. But this may change. Now, with the same sample period, we also find the investor do price a company's environmental transparency. So a company with a greater transparency in its environmental issues can enjoy the cheaper equity financing cost. So that's from me. Thank you. Well, thank you extremely uh, much. Uh, it's very good, Alan, and also uh, also for being uh, so punctual, which is extremely nice. And I'd like to uh, now move on, if we could, uh, to Alessandra. And while Alessandra is getting her slides up there, uh, Alessandra is dialing in um, from the University of Pavia, where she's the assistant professor of banking and finance at the Department of Economics and Management. Uh, she is part of two EU-funded pro projects, uh, FinTech and Periscope, and also part of the cost FinAI that promotes transparency in FinTech. Uh, Alessandra, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Michael. Good afternoon to everyone and thank you for having me here. My greetings from, from Italy. Uh, I will try to give you a brief perspective on what finance can do in helping uh, uh, companies to become greener, more sustainable. So I will focus uh, mainly on green transition, but of course, uh, uh, as we know, ESG is a complicated issue. So, a complicated issue. So, uh, my talk won't be so uh, exhaustive. So, uh, just for those who are not familiar with fintech, uh, I will address the digital finance uh, as the provision of uh, uh, financial uh, solutions and products uh, that happen through technological uh, so technological device or uh, business models. Uh, this uh, has emerged uh, more recently since 2008, but it has, uh, it has given a very strong push in the last uh, years, especially uh, during the last year of, of COVID. The digitalization has increased a lot. Uh, we, we see many different business models, many different new companies, uh, and also old companies that um, expanded themselves uh, in the financial field like uh, you know Google, Amazon and all these uh, uh, so-called big tech companies. Uh, I will try to give you an example on how the various type of fintech solution can help companies in delivering uh, uh, green innovation or in becoming uh, more sustainable from the um, environmental point of view. Uh, you will find a remark in these slides that there are many different business models. Uh, so uh, I will refer to the general business model, but of course there might be uh, exceptions and specific cases. Um, crowdfunding and peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms are essentially websites uh, that enable uh, retail investors to select uh, the um, entrepreneur or the initiative they would like to finance and they can do it through equity or debt. And uh, while these uh, uh, generally occurs for uh, the vast population of, of companies, there are some platforms that have decided to uh, specialize in green financing. For instance, we have BetterVest that uh, provides 
investments uh, opportunities in, uh, for instance, uh, the installation of uh, solar panels in many different countries, also including uh, um, emerging economies. So this is a way how emerging economies can uh, obtain financing uh, from the, let's say, the wide crowd of investors but of course there might be also uh, institutional investors behind this platform uh, another option is for instance one planet crowd um, that is also offering uh, through its uh, its platform uh, a bond loan so uh, it can be equity as said or it can be a loan that uh, investors can subscribe to finance this type of uh, um, green oriented innovation. Another important innovation in the asset management has been the introduction of robot advisors that essentially perform uh, the old job of uh, financial, con financial advice through an algorithm. So the investor inputs its uh, characteristics and then the algorithm produces some uh, investment advice. Generally, uh, these tend to be advice on investing in ETF, ETF that are very, um, let's say, transparent and listed. Uh, but there are some robot advisors that are specialized in the green uh, type of investment. So they only include ETF that satisfy the ESG, um, the ESG requirements uh, and also partner with some data provider that allow you to rank your investments or to evaluate your investments according to the greeniness of your, of your investment. Um, Another example, this is uh, uh, also quite interesting and it's becoming quite important in the last uh, few years, um, Insurtech, so the provision of insurance uh, contracts or uh, insurance products through digital solution. Uh, here we have the double role of uh, insurance companies that are not only providers of uh, coverage for uh, so policies for extreme events that might be related to climate change, such as floods, droughts, or extreme temperatures, but they also act as institutional investors. So they can be one of the players that redirect the resources in the system uh, to more sustainable uh, investments so um, they have be they are becoming more aware of the need to include the ESG uh, factors in their investment decisions and this also applies of course to uh, to banks uh, and other institutional investors such as pens pension funds um, uh, one of the most outbreaking innovation of fintech was the introduction of cryptocurrencies. I won't go in detail into this, uh, but uh, essentially the, I'm citing this because uh, the way that companies can raise capital now is also possible through cryptocurrencies. So instead of an IPO, they do these ICOs, so initial coin offerings. And uh, this is a way that fintech also helps uh, startups, especially innovative startups, to raise, com raise funds. Cryptocurrencies and stable coins, especially Bitcoin, have a very, um, a very serious issue on uh, the energy consumption. Uh, but now things are changing and now uh, we are going through a green Bitcoin uh, um, type of, of mining. Although, uh, as you know, sustainability is a complex issue and so having uh, the uh, certification that the energy used to mine Bitcoin might not be that, that easy. Then on the overall financial system, uh, we have some initiatives by old uh, banks, uh, let's say traditional banks, that have started to include ESG, as said, uh, in, their, um, in their investment uh, strategies, but have also uh, developed some uh, initiatives for their, for their uh, customers 
putting much effort in trying to promote uh, the attention to climate change uh, in uh, more, let's say, simpler things like uh, using uh, uh, recycled uh, plastic for uh, their debit or credit cards or uh, providing some current accounts that and cards connected to this account that essentially plant a tree every, uh, let's say, one, 100 euros and as in the example on the slide that people spend on the card. Um, it might just be one drop in the ocean, but still uh, something is moving also on, on, this, uh, on this end. As Ellen was saying uh, uh, in her presentation, also the cultural, uh, um, cultural uh, framework and environment is changing. So um, banks are getting this opportunity to uh, get new shares of the market that are uh, uh, particularly concerned with these uh, environmental issues. And finally, my conclusions. Uh, um, well, uh, digital finance uh, is, uh, is uh, a way uh, is an opportunity uh, that might enable uh, in investments uh, to be directed to more uh, green or ESG uh, investment opportunities. So funds are being redirected uh, into these uh, type of investments. Uh, COVID was uh, a for forced push towards digitalization and also towards more attention on the interconnectedness between uh, environmental, social and the governance pillars of the ESG framework. However, uh, although institutions are moving, uh, um, there is still need uh, for uh, more uh, cooperation among uh, uh, international uh, bodies and uh, increased uh, disclosure is one of the main objectives. Uh, well, it should be, in my opinion, one of the main objectives uh, to really foster uh, uh, the opportunity for companies to raise uh, funds for the green transition. Um, I, I think, uh, okay, this is my last slide. So if you want to contact me here, you have the contacts. And thank you very much for listening to my presentation today. Alessandra, thank you so much for a great contribution. And also may I compliment you too on your punctuality. Uh, very impressive. Uh, we'll come back, I think, with a lot of questions for both you and Ellen, but we're gonna move on to Harry Elliott now. Uh, while Harry's getting his slides up, Harry is a consultant with the GS Group, which is a corporate finance firm interested in SMEs. Uh, Harry is also the commercial director for Liquid Nano Group and Diox, uh, and he therefore has got a lot of experience of kind of just making decisions about an investment, but then executing them. And he's going to talk to us today about two case studies, Pulpex and Diox. Harry, the floor is yours. Hi there. Firstly, thank you to everyone for hosting me. It's a great pleasure to do this. I'll kick straight off with the objectives of my PowerPoint. It's to understand the role of green finance within a capital raising sector from my experience gained with GS Advisory. Explore the shift towards investors focusing on sustainability, evidenced by a recent GS fundraise for Polpex. Discuss the role of financial allocation from managers towards sustainable projects internally within a corporate setting. This is garnered from my time as commercial director for the CoSaint Deox Liquid Nano Group. Understand how top down macroeconomic policy and regulatory change that Ellen touched on is shaping the future of financing new projects and discuss the means by which companies can incorporate both contemporary strategies and green finance principles. So I'll kick off with the GS stuff. G GS Advisory are a corporate finance house that's raised about 250 million across various SME businesses globally uh, over the last six years. What we've noticed in the last few years is that investment, investor sentiment towards green finance is shifting considerably. Our latest fundraise for Polpex was actually oversubscribed, which in the venture capital world is always a good result. We also raise capital for the CoSaint Group, which houses both the Liquid Nano and Deox Group. Despite this increased appetite amongst investors, significant hurdles still prevail. 
for instance, there's a really heavy focus on infrastructure within the green finance private industry, and they often have very long lead times to profitability and high initial capex costs. So I wanted to take a look at why Polpex was so successful in raising capital. Firstly, a brief introduction to what they do. They're a multi-leading packaging technology company, which essentially replaces glass and PET bottles with 100% biodegradable pulp bottles. And if you check out their website, which I advise you do, you'll see that they do the new Johnny Walker black bottles in pulp-based form. What's interesting about Polpex is that it's backed by beverage leader Diageo and has other major contracts with large multinational corporates like GSK. And you can see the two testimonials and press releases on the slideshow to the right. Polpex also didn't go down the traditional manufacturing path and instead decided to license their technology out in order for them to scale quicker whilst also developing, patenting, and launching the solution, proving the concept, and thus raising six and a half million through GS and UK VC Group Pilot Light Ventures. I think what was pertinent for Polpex was it's a combination of the macroeconomic drivers surrounding uh, lack of usage for uh, plastic bottles, strong fundamentals, strong partners, and a unique contemporary scalable business model that meant that they ended up being oversubscribed. And I think it's fair to say they're poised for success commercially. And I think what's interesting is if we take note of what Ellen said regarding the penalization of firms uh, developing in sustainability, Polpex actually raised money at a fairly sensible valuation for, for the corporate itself while still giving good upside for the investors. So I think there's a slight difference between private and public markets because often private markets look much further into the future due to the long holding patterns of private investments. So let's have a look from a commercial setting how managers can allocate funding for uh, sustainability and green finance internally once that said finance is raised. So firstly, I'll give a brief introduction to Deox. Deox creates eco-friendly finishing chemicals, namely antimicrobial agents that pre prevent the spread of COVID-19 and durable water repellency coatings, DWR, that improve the performance of textiles but don't cost the earth. The textile industry is a very polluting industry and it's very wasteful. It ranks the second most polluting industry after oil and before the livestock industry. The textile problem can be divided into three categories, as you can see on the slide. Pollution, ethics and waste. I'll touch on pollution and waste because pollution wise, there was many chemicals used historically that, and even still today that are very damaging to the environment namely the use of C8, which contained dangerous fluorocarbons, which since several campaigns from environmental lobbying groups that you can see in the top right have since been banned. So if any of you are keen skiers like myself, you'll know that a ski jacket 10 years ago was actually much more durable than a ski jacket now. So what Deox does is create the same performance uh, of fabric coating, but with significantly reduced or zero fluorocarbons, which are one of the leading damaging groups to the textile sector. I think as the world's attention focuses on how the textile sector intends to move forward towards more sustainable practices, Deox is in a prime position to disrupt this by providing nanotechnology based chemicals for fabrics that deliver leading performance on an environmentally friendly basis. So how does this actually work commercially and how is Deox allocating resources to do so? Deox, via its sister company Liquid Nano, launched an antimicrobial mask that lasts 20 washes to prevent the requirement for using disposable masks since the COVID-19 pandemic. We also partnered with Save the Med to allocate part of the revenues to reducing waste in the Mediterranean. And as you can see in the diagram, it gives you an indication of how many masks are used to one of our masks. Deox also powers shoe protection coating repeller which offers an eco-friendly CFC non-aerosol based alternative to CREP Protect. Saving the planet one step at a time, greener better is their catch line. What 
I touched on on the slide before was the amount of water used to produce a ton of garments. It's 200 to the ton. So every time you throw away a garment, this is something people typically don't realize. It's costing the earth. So using an eco-friendly coating for a pair of trainers that makes it last longer and prolongs the life of said garment is actually incredibly beneficial to the environment. That's why these industrial coatings are already being sold into fabric mills as a finishing agent to the uh, now as an alternative to the now banned C8 coating. We're also launching a regeneration product or product as a service focusing on sustainability. So to overcome the ski jacket issue I mentioned in the slide before, you can take it in every year for a service and they give it a top up with this chemical to, uh, to, to give it the same repellency but without putting any harmful toxins into the environment. To summarise, as with Pulpex, Deox is launching new sustainable products on both a B2B, a B2B to C and a D to C strategy in an innovative fashion which relies less on manufacturing to bricks and mortar outlets and instead adopting new market practices to achieve penetration from its green finance funding. And such, this is how the cash allocations from the Cosent group are being dis decided. So what's the outcome of all this? I think it's fair to say that the world is changing and governments are becoming increasingly focused on regulatory action to drive, to drive sustainable change. And as evidenced by Diageo's backing of Polpex, the big corporates are also starting to take action. I think investors can benefit from this by backing emerging, uh, emerging businesses that disrupt legacy businesses that have been damaging to the environment rather than accretive. Companies can also adopt modern business principles in the capital raising sector, such as the licensing model and products as a service to garner investment within the private investment sector and access cheaper sources of capital, overcoming challenges on infrastructure based products with long lead times to profitability. I think that adopting a sustainable approach to investing and commercial decision making slash cash allocations can ultimately be beneficial for all parties involved. As course, of course, as mentioned by Ellen, there's always a degree of risk, speculation and heavy R&D involved in such pro projects, hence the discount. However, when you summarise it, I think it's worth investors and corporates alike allocating resources into sustainability versus immediate profit, because historically long term investing has always outperformed the quick pursuits of profits. And as I think we can all agree on this panel, regulatory change is only going one way thank you that's all from me well harry thank you very much and uh, equally uh, i love it when all the panelists are so punctual this is this is excellent uh and we're going to turn now uh, van has been listening to all of this and coming at it very much from a finance city of london type of perspective uh, van works uh, as the global head of currency in the investment division of russell and his research concentrates on asset allocation, currency markets, and ESG issues and investments. And he's also quite an accomplished writer with uh, articles in the Review of Quantitative Finance and Accounting, Business Strategy and the Environment, and the Journal of Fixed Income and the Journal of Investment Management. So Van, the floor is very much yours. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, it's great listening to the experts on from academia and business. And it's, it's a pleasure to be the discussant in this session. What I want to do is to put what we heard into the context of five long-term trends that I see in the space of uh, sustainable finance from the perspective of the, the asset manager and the investor. And I'm just going to share, I only have one slide. Uh, so please bear with me. And you will see the, the five trends listed on this slide and the five trends are uh, climate risk change, ESG investing, impact investing, innovations in information processing and financial innovation. So if I may start with the, um, the first point, the climate risk change, and, and I think it goes to what problem we are trying to solve uh, in, this, in this session. Uh, the, the, the risk of climate change and the, the loss of biodiversity. So as you all know, um, we had the Paris Agreement that aims to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees 
from the pre-industrial um, uh, age. And we've recently had um, pledges by governments to achieve net zero carbon emissions. Um, for example, the UK government pledged to reduce emissions by 78% by 2035. And in the investment industry, I, th I think this notion that climate risk is becoming investment risk is more and more accepted that you, you might have some assets such as oil fields that become stranded, uh, stranded assets and that as an investment climate uh, risk change uh, is, is a long-term risk that uh, investors need to take, take into account. So that's, I think, the, the starting point as far as the environmental aspect is concerned. Uh, in the industry, um, there's this new initiative, the Net Zero Asset Managers Initiatives, where um, a number of asset managers like uh, Russell Investments have uh, pledged to support net zero carbon emissions by 2050. And we're starting with um, our own business operations and we're trying to be uh, carbon neutral with our own business operations by 2030. But obviously, you know, changing the investee companies, that's a much, much uh, longer process. So if you take that as the starting point that we want to um, achieve what we aim for in the Paris Agreement, the other four trends support that that goal: product innovation, financial instruments innovation, uh, innovation in the investment processes. So, if I can move on to the next uh, to the next trend, the tr the trend towards integrating ESG aspects into the investment process, environmental, social, and governance aspects into the um, into the investment process. To me. And Michael, you've you've written about this as well, or your colleagues have written about this. Uh, incorporating ESG is a way to align the short-term horizon of, let's say, asset managers like myself and uh, corporate managers with the long-term horizon of these environmental environmental risks. So that's one one way of looking at ESG. The other way of looking at ESG is that. Um, maybe investors might even accept lower returns if their values are incorporated into their investments so if they you know dislike tobacco or some other uh, some other industry then uh, then they want that value to be incorporated in the investment now the the measurement of esg is extremely extremely difficult and far from completely objective um, ESG scores are made by humans on a on a subjective uh, subjective basis, and when you look at different ESG data providers, you might have, uh, you know, one com company scoring highly uh, on on one provider's uh, methodology, but very lowly on another provider's. So I think that's that's a, a challenge that we really face face in the industry. Uh, the third. The third trend I wanted to address is that towards impact investing. So if I may distinguish um, ESG investing and impact investing, impact investing is uh, quite, quite close to what, uh, what Harry described, that we invest to make a positive impact in the environmental or social sphere, even if it means possibly accepting a lower rate of return. So investing in a renewable energy company, for example, rather than just tilting your energy investments towards companies that have higher ESG scores. So uh, a lot of the ESG investing these days is deciding whether, you know, BP is better than Shell on an, on an ESG perspective. So I think that's, that's, that's the difference. And I was really interested in hearing about Ellen's research and that environmental innovation is not necessarily rewarded by the market with a lower cost of equity. So that's really interesting. Um, the fourth trend are innovations in data processing, and that goes to what uh, what Alexander talked about, uh, which I listened to with great interest about uh, you know AI and uh, machine learning and and 
the role for big data and blockchain technology in this in this sphere. I mentioned earlier that uh, ESG data is quite a complex field. There's a variety of data providers with conflicting results. It's difficult to judge the quality of the data and how to incorporate that data into the investment uh, investment process and their scope for what we call greenwashing that is greenwashing at the asset manager level where you know people like us stick an esg label on a product and it's not really esg and there's also the scope for greenwashing at the company level uh, where companies pretend to be green but they're they, they aren't really and 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 maybe innovations in in data processing can address some of these issues so blockchain technology might help to verify uh, certain pieces of data that are relevant to the to the ESG sphere. And then lastly, we have all the innovations that are going on in financial instruments, uh, broadly called green finance and uh, green bonds are a part of that. Harry talked about the use of, uh, you know, private equity or venture capital in this space. Uh, the EU has been at the forefront of um, defining a green bond standard to support the transition to a low carbon economy. And we know that this, this EU recovery fund, quite a big fiscal stimulus, 800 billion euros worth of bond issuance may contain up to 30% of green bond issuance. So it's, it's definitely a very, very uh, a topical, uh, a, a topical instrument. At the same time, and that's where I would be interested in hearing Michael's view is uh, you have advocated a different instrument, uh, the government policy performance bond, and you you might want to uh, talk about that and the challenges that that you might see with, you know, the green bonds as they are as they are constructed uh, right now. But yeah, I really enjoyed the three talks that we had from Alan, Alessandra, and and Harry, and I think they are really highly relevant to the work that we're doing in the investment uh, industry. Well, thank you very much, Van, for that warm reception to the academic presentations. And that is clearly what Birkbeck is trying to achieve, is getting academia, industry, business, and the wider, the wider environment chatting. And I really, uh, I think I might come back at the end of your five trends. Um, you mentioned very kindly uh, one other proposal which I've been making for a number of years called po policy performance bonds. Those arose uh, really from the idea that green bonds are about use of proceeds. So I'm I'm asking you for a bunch of money and I'm going to invest it in X, like biomass or something. Uh, policy performance bonds were put forward as no, here's the target. So I'm going to reduce my carbon emissions over the next five years by 20%. Every year I need to go down 4%. If I fail to achieve that, I pay more interest on the bond. So it's a much more an outcome uh, focused type bond. They have taken off quite significantly on the continent over the last three or four years with large issues uh, from the likes of um, Louis Vuitton, Danone, Enel. Uh, and we had our first big one here in the United Kingdom in January when Trig, uh, the Renewable Energy Investment Group, uh, issued a 500 million pound policy performance bond. They're also called performance incentive, ESG link, sustainability link. So the terminology is coming together, um, but it does seem to be being picked up by the larger players. But uh, thank you for that. Um, I've got a few uh, questions here. What I'd like to do, uh, start off if I could, uh, Jacqueline Wynn Stanley has put in the, into the chat room, I think a really good place to begin, uh, and one that Alessandra might want to have a word on, and, and also Harry. Um, she's keen to have a discussion on the importance of all of this stuff uh, in, in terms of upscaling inclusive entrepreneurship and the emergence of angel investors who are looking to move towards rewards beyond profit. So, uh, Alessandra, did you see any of these new fintech applications targeted at angel investors in the ESG space? And Harry, you know, is this a source of funding that you, you guys are looking at at uh, GS? Absolutely. Okay. Oh, so shall, you go shall I go first? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, uh, um, as I said, there are many business models, and one of these on crowdfunding platform, for instance, um, that I know is essentially a group of business angels that are uh, located geographically distant, 
but that can uh, find themselves discussing investment opportunity in this uh, club deal, it's called. And uh, I think that part of the, the, the discussion is going towards these green investing and impact investing, especially after the COVID that we have seen uh, um, many, let's say, local uh, firms that are striving uh, to, to survive. So I think that the discussion is moving towards this direction to, to promote also the uh, regional economy or the local economy. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. Well, what's very interesting about the angel and crowdfunding sector to me, because I've worked with it for the last six years, is that especially six or seven years ago, there was a big push towards private investors doing all the deals on their own via EIS funding. And it actually had a pretty bad impact on the market because it overhyped all the valuations and then a lot of companies got really badly penalised on the way down. What's interesting now, which we're seeing the emergence of, and I think is actually a much better and more sustainable approach to green finance, is we're seeing these uh, venture capital groups pro uh, pop up, like Pilot Light Ventures, that are funded by the angels themselves. And then the angels, they, they subscribe to the fund, but then they also have the opportunity to invest more in any one given proje project. That or company that the, the fund is investing in. And there's another co uh, company that does just that called Concentric Investment Partners we work with. So I think the, the, the problem with crowdfunding and angel investing is that it's very difficult to do due diligence on these projects. And a lot of the time managers fall victim to hubris and overestimating, which there's enough university research to back up for sure. But the, these new sustainability impact focused funds backed by angels, I think are going to be really influential in driving sustainability and green finance forward, as we've seen with Pulpex, which has been immensely successful in garnering support from some of the biggest companies in the world. Okay. Um, Van, uh, uh, kind of a question for you. ESG in the city, or at least the, the, the idea behind rating ESG for shares and, and bonds is really to adjust the cost of capital. Uh, and uh, as somebody who participated in apartheid marches in the 70s, uh, students, we believed if we could get our university foundations to disinvest, that would increase the cost of capital in South Africa and this would force a uh, apartheid end. Of course, that never happened. It's quite an indirect uh, sort of a force here. Now, in the green bond market, there's been a lot of talk that green the, the, the interest rates on green bonds are lower than traditional bonds, but a green bond also comes with a heavy upfront cost in terms of certification and validation. And I've, I've heard from people that by the time you put that over the life of the bond, they come out about equal. Uh, but it's a moving market. And have you seen a genuine uh, kind of either premium or uh, for green bonds, or are they really being issued at lower interest rates? I think there's there's um, there's a lot of interest in uh, in the green bond uh, space. But what you mentioned is a good point that maybe it the downside of designating a green bond is that it fragments the market liquidity. So you have normal uh, government bonds for general purposes and then you have this almost new asset class but uh, it, it makes the sizes of the is issues smaller and that that might actually because of the liquidity issues um, all things equal uh, drive up the cost uh, so that's that's one one thing that we need to take into account there there's there's a proposal by the Bruegel uh, policy uh, think tank. I'm not sure whether you are aware of it. They they're talking about green certificates, where you know uh, there's these certificates are kind of normal government bonds, but they are attached to some kind of green project where you might be able to address the fragmentation issue. So I think we are still very very early in this asset class, and some of the the downsides we still need to figure out. Um, but yeah, there's there's certainly a lot of a, a lot of interest. Mm. Now, Ellen, your presentation I found fascinating. I, I used to handle the investment of about forty percent of UK government R and D, so I, I have always been interested in where does R and D 
make or not make returns. Um, but it's, it's, it too is a very long-term trend here. Um, people have spoken about the sort of ESG uh, alphabet soup, I think the economists called it, so many competing uh, systems out there. How did you address that in your research? How, how were you able to identify the environmental companies clearly? The companies, the environmental issues, the environmental performance. Yeah, that's a very good question. Usually when we submit our paper to the journal editor, that's, uh, for the environmental performance, it's, it's easier than the, uh, than the company performance in social dimension and the governance dimension. Because uh, in addition to re purely rely on the uh, environment environmental performance rated by the rating agencies, we also have an absolute number like greenhouse gas emissions and the greenhouse gas intensity. But if we would like to evaluate a company's performance in the social and the government dimension, it is it, it's, it's more difficult because we don't really have a, the absolute, absolute number to observe. So. Uh, as far as I know, usually uh, for uh, for the social dimension, the only indicator everyone can accept is the human right, human right index. Then the, for the rest of the indicator, it, uh, it's quite difficult to uh, it's quite difficult to to measure in in the social dimension. If I may, if I might just add to that, uh, Michael. And so I think this this issue of ESG scores being somewhat subjective, and there being a great dispersion between different providers of ESG scores, I think that's that's really a big issue because um, there's a there's an excellent article in the journal, journal Portfolio Management by two people from Vanguard who measured the correlation of ESG scores across different providers, and it's, it's as, as low as 0.4, you would think it should be close to one, right? I mean, if, if, it's, if, it's, if this concept of ESG is uh, reliably measured, uh, the correlations between different providers should be quite high, like you know, gov government uh, credit ratings, the correlation is 0.95 or something like that. So I think this uh, this dispersion issue and this measurement issue in the ESG sphere is uh, definitely uh, definitely a challenge. Okay. Uh, may okay. I add more? <laughs> may I add more? <laughs> so okay, usually yeah. we, we will be challenged by the reviewer as well, if we purely rely on the uh, rating from the uh, rating pro, uh, from the agency. So what do we have to do is that we need to create our own index. Then, based on the greenhouse gas emission or the uh, waste management, then we compare with the performance score from the uh, rating agency. Yeah. Thank you, Ellen. Um, there's a broad question which I think all four of you might have some opinions on from Amy Knight. Uh, thank you very much, Amy. She'd like to hear your views on how impact investing can be directed towards the business support ecosystems, the enterprise hubs, and incubators that educate entrepreneurs and increase the success rate of startups. Um, you know, this, is, this is how we ensure green investments are directed in the right way to support growth and not wasted. Um, so I don't know, Harry, I might turn to you first on this one, but any quick thoughts on, on Amy's point? Yeah, I think the biggest thing we're lacking within the UK and Brexit for all its sins, rightly or wrongly, it's actually an initiative we could ad adopt with Brexit is a sovereign fund that backs uh, a, a UK sovereign fund that backs said entrepreneurs and lays out the criteria. I think that's really missing. Obviously, we have some uh, some growth funds which have a little bit of government funding, like the uh, the British Growth Fund, but nothing by and large. And if they back to back that with the bond issuance and bonds against that, that with institutional backing market and that could solve the liquidity issue that Van brought attention to earlier. Okay, good. Uh, Alessandra, uh, any, any thoughts there as you were looking across this wave of fintech startups? 
Uh, well, what, what I can say is that the number of platform is very high. So this might yield to a problem of fragmentation. So essential investors might not know whether uh, all these opportunities that are sold as advertised as the best opportunity are actually the best opportunities. So in these, I think that the European, with reference to the European Union, they made this uh, regulation on um, these crowdfunding platforms to ensure more transparency and uh, to increase the level of standards so that uh, when investors, uh, potential investors see the opportunities, uh, they are informed about the risks and the uh, quality of the, of the project that they're about to fund. Because of course, we must, must not forget that the final objective should be uh, the one to uh, address the resources in the most efficient way. So to promote the best companies, the ones that are more promising and uh, uh, that can, in this case, truly provide the uh, necessary steps towards a greener uh, society and the greener economy. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to turn to uh, to Van for a, a second here, and then I'm going to ask all, all four of you a closing question. Um, the question I'd just like to pick up is uh, Harry uh, J. Elliott has a doppelganger in the chat room, I notice, and uh, uh, he's asking here uh, very much, uh, Van, do you think there's any similarity between the 2000 rating for fee scandal with regards to mortgages and ESG? And, a sort of a, a follow-on point from that. Are you aware of any initiatives to have listed bond futures on ESG bonds in the market? Uh, so on, maybe I'll, uh, the, the second one is easy because I'm not aware of uh, uh, any initiatives. The, the first question on ESG ratings and um, whether it could be a similar phenomenon as the rating for fees scandal, I think that is a that is a risk, but I think policymakers are aware of of that risk of greenwashing. Um, that you know maybe retail investors don't have the time to really look into the documentation or um, do a lot of research on whether a fund is really green or sustainable. So I think the SFDR um, regulation is trying to address some of that and and try to. Um, try to have a certain minimum standard for these uh, types of labels. Um, but I think, you know, in, in, the, in the end, I think institutional investors will be the ones that have the, the resources to really look, look into whether a investment product is, is really ESG and what ESG aspects are really incorporated uh, in, into the investment process. It's definitely a risk. Okay, well, we're down to our last sort of 100 seconds, folks. So I'm going to ask you each to be very succinct, and I'll do it in order. The question I'd like to ask you is we have uh, COP26, a convention of the parties, uh, coming here in the United Kingdom up in Glasgow in November, unless it's rescheduled, but it's looking likely. Uh, what would you most like to see? Um, Ellen? Uh, that's a good question. Oh, According to my empirical result, the degree of a company's environmental innovation is not priced by the investor yet. So is it critical? Uh, I would like to see the financial market participants and the policymaker, business innovator, academic, collaborate to co-create the solution. So maybe like a financial environmental friendly policy for the larger capital firm because actually our research focus on all the uh, largest company uh, listed in the MSCI World Index. So maybe as Harry said, for the smaller company, they benefit oh. from the environmental innovation and they can enjoy the cheaper cost equity. Yeah. Thank you. Alessandra? Uh, I think I would go for more transparency and more global coordination on the standards so to avoid, let's say, regulatory arbitrage as we have seen in other areas of business in the past. That Great. would be Thank my you. priority. Um, Thank you very much. Harry, COP26? Um, as a lover of ingenuity and entrepreneurship, I'd just like to see more programs towards entrepreneurs, especially government-backed, to allow for 
brilliant minds to really come forward and drive sustainability in an actual sustainable fashion rather than just speaking about sustainability actually adopt practices that do improve sustainability thank you and Van. yeah what i'd really like to see apart from the things that were mentioned is um i think it's quite useful to have market me mechanisms in this space as well uh, carbon trading is, is one one example um, where we, we can put a price on on the externalities that are being created by uh, carbon emissions. I think that's that's quite a fruitful way to uh, to enable the transition to a lower lower carbon economy. Mm. Well, I think that's a great place on which to draw things sadly to a close. We're getting some. Uh, thanks for the session, et cetera, which is always a sign that we've run over time. Uh, so I'd like to like to close on that. I think it's 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 an exciting period, and we've we've spoken about a lot here on climate change, ESG investing, impact investing, uh, innovations in AI, and uh, you know financial innovation, as Van summarized. Um, I personally, um, I, I think I do quite agree with Van. It was back in Kyoto in '97 at the COP there that we agreed that we were going to charge for carbon emissions. And sometimes I, I like to go back to the future. You know, it's a, it's really the probably the hardest uh, way to look at it if you start looking at numbers of approximately 500 euros a European, for example, per annum, you begin to see that that'll make behavior change, maybe a lot more than getting a, a rating agency label. Uh, but we'll see what happens in COP26. It's going to be exciting. As I often like to say, you know, you know, let's be optimistic. Pessimism is for better times. So uh, hopefully COP26 will deliver. Uh, Helen, you wanted to say a word in closing, is that correct? Yes, thank you. I, I would like to use this opportunity to say thank you to Michael to be a great chair. And thank you to Professor Helen, give us the, the opportunity to talk about the green finance and innovation. So thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, and, and, and my thanks too to everybody. Uh, I echo the comments in the chat. Brilliant session. So uh, I, I really have enjoyed it because you can relax because it was well moderated, excellent presentation. And, and the respect between you all, uh, re referencing each other's work, I thought that was excellent and the way you responded to the questions too. So really enjoyable, absolutely excellent. So thank you all very much and, and thank you Ola and thank you Isabel who will be doing the, the blog on this. So, so thank you and thank you Ellen for taking the lead on this. <laughs> And Orla, thank I believe you all. Thank Orla. you. Great. Okay. Take care, everyone, and hope to see you all soon. Yeah. Bye. Thank you very much. Very good. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.